Let us begin. Name Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. We turn to a blessed sacrament uh, before us, asking um, our Lord's blessings and love. And so let's just say the Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from it. Um, Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. Peter Claver, and all the holy angels and saints. So, I mentioned the four talks, three yesterday, three one hours, one hour this morning, and the final talk on Sunday. They're really one of a piece, and they are responding to Father Edwin's, our rector's, request that we cover three topics, but decided to inscribe it within the larger framework of the spiritual life. So we began with on uh, yesterday at 9 a.m. with the two pillars of the Christian life that Jesus taught Catherine of Siena. The foundation, which is self-knowledge, self my humility, my nothingness. And the highest one, which is uh, think of me and I'll think of you, uh, look, always looking at Jesus, but here we're talking about looking at Jesus, um, his, his, his holy will in the sacrament of the present moment, which is what the second talk was. The second talk uh, was the developing the second of the two pillars. But we will find that that always goes back to the first pillar. So the sacrament of the present moment, of how we find God arranges everything. All of our, each of us, our individual histories is all within God's plan. And as with Jesus, uh, God, uh, the Father arranged everything. So you and I have to do things, of course. He's asking us to do things, our studies, and so on. But all of that is within a larger framework of his guidance. And we have to allow ourselves to be that, that child um, so that we aren't just doing our work, like we're living in God, but God living in us. That's a, that's a higher level. The, 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 the thing is, is try to find some way of explaining why this is so powerful, why this is the greatest way, which is the way of Nazareth, or Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. It's, a, it's also the way of Therese. It really uh, that it synthesizes that uh, Therese. Excuse me, I, I, I have the laws into my mouth. Um, and, and so that's why we went to the third uh, hour yesterday was on going back at it, looking at the three classical stages of the spiritual life. John of the Cross has a three, um, Father Lanama uh, um, that Father Jacques quotes uh, he, he has a three, um, Faustina has a three. It's all, it's always three stages of faith, of suffering, of doing God's will. It's always three. And what most of us do is we get stuck in the first level. We, we have to start at the first level and do it well. Because we do it well, we don't realize there's, a, there's another level. Um, and so, uh, let me just um, explain that. It's a little bit, uh, many of you have seen the movie uh, Rio, right? The animated film about this uh, macaw. Did I, did I mention that yesterday? I, I, I don't think I did, right? So this is macaw. I think maybe I did. Hmm. Um, so this macaw was captured in Brazil or somewhere and brought to the US and fell off a truck. Uh, a, a girl called Linda uh, found the, the little chick and the, the macaw never learned to fly. The macaw was really good. He used GPS and all the human stuff. But um, some birds, seagulls coming by would make fun of him because he couldn't fly. When we stay at the first level only, we don't do what God is calling us to because Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, reminds us, one of the chapters is called the universal call of, of holiness, that all baptized are called to be saints. It's something, we, we didn't used to think that. We used to think, okay, only priests and religious and nuns with their special formation and so on, special vocation, only they can become um, saints. And that's not true. Call of vocation, holiness is the call of baptism. And every single one of us are meant, uh, holiness is simply going up to the upper mansions. But we get stuck in the lower mansions because we, we get good at it. We get good at uh, intellectual pursuits. We get good at um, being responsible and so on, at our jobs, at our studies. We're meant to be eagles. Um, there are four I mentioned this, I forget what I'm mentioning now, there are four evangelists. Um, the reason why I'm confused is because I'm giving a talk to spiritual, I can't remember what I told them or what I told you. 
So, um, the, the four evangelists and, the, the, and they're in the four um, something here, the, the four windows. And um, one of them is the eagle, and that's John. John is very mystical. Somebody's point, uh, somebody's point, uh, yeah, right, uh, in order to is, is over there. Jo John is different from the other three synoptic uh, uh, gospel writers. He's very mystical. He begins, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word, and, and the word was with God, with God. In, in the Greek, it's even more uh, uh, succinct, quite beautiful. He starts with the Trinity, he's mystical compared to the other three. Even the book of Revelation written by John is also very, it, it speaks about heaven and earth. It's very, very mystical. And you and I are meant to be like John, the eagle. And if, if you know anything about the eagle, is I've seen them, I've seen the rare one, but I've seen them on TV. And, they, and they're up in the heights. They're not like seagulls. They're way, way up the heights of mountains. And, and they don't, they're not kind of flapping um, like, like um, uh, Canada geese do. They are soaring. And, and each of us are meant to be spiritual eagles, um, climbing up to the heights, soaring on the ruah, the, the currents of the Holy Spirit. That's what we, all of us are meant to do. But if you are, and John of the Cross uses this uh, image, if, if, we are a, if you're an eagle and one leg is held, is tied with a string to a post, that eagle doesn't fly. And yet we're, when, when we are wrapped up with all of the human gifts, we, 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 we like that attachment that prevents us from flying. And by the way, to go to the upper mansions, go to the fourth mansion or um, of the trees of Jesus in an ca interior castle, or the second stage of John of the Cross, which is the illuminated stage, you and I can't do it. The Holy Spirit has to pick us up. That's how powerful it is. John of the Cross calls it contemplation, the inflow of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a divine action. And, and, and you and I have to let go, and hence not the passivity, but the receptivity the person who is just always in charge and doing things, uh, that person doesn't get very far in, in his spiritual life. Um, our Lord said to um, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, well, he taught her something, and she said to a nun when she was g getting older, she said, I'm finally beginning to realize, by the way, she's the one who received the Sacred Heart apparitions. I'm finally beginning to understand what Jesus has been telling me all along. Let me do it. Let me do it. We get in a way when, when we don't know how to be to allow the Lord. It's, it's a little bit like, um, if you use an instrument, we're like a violin. And, but but he, he is the, he, uh, the musician, he is a violinist. And, but but it, the violin can do something on his own. But if you have, um, say, a cellist like Yo-Yo Ma, I don't know any other, then, then you have a beautiful masterpiece coming. If it's a Holy Spirit, it's not, we are not supposed to play it. The Holy Spirit is, is meant to be. That, that's the, the end goal. Okay. Now, so today, what we want to do is talk about, this is one of Father Edwin's um, uh, uh, requests. We talk about universal love. And he mentioned it this morning. Universal love, but also that leads to the cross. So that's what we want to talk about this morning. However, I, I think we need about at least 15 minutes to tie up some loose ends, to clarify certain things we talked about uh, yesterday, three things in particular. So those two levels, not getting stuck in the lower level, going to the 90% of the upper level. Also talk about, uh, um, what was it? Uh, talk about obedience, talk about uh, fraternal correction. Okay, let's talk about the first. To illustrate a point of what we are inclined to do, I mentioned the Marine Chaplain, all about heroism you know, that basic training, that tough basic, and, and a test called the crucible, you know, bringing news about to the widows or widowers of the death of their, you know, um, marine, uh, um, or I know, uh, soldier, and so on. A priest told me once, and he's ordained several years ago, that in the previous Lent, I, I mentioned this in the book, by the way, the fourth book, in the previous Lent he had, uh, fasted on bread and water on, on Wednesdays and Fridays of that Lent. And during all of Lent, he slept on the floor. That, that's typical of us. We feel that if you, if you do difficult things, you know, that's very pleasing to God. And, and it is pleasing to our Lord. This is a very uh, dedicated priest. I, I myself, 
when I was years ago, and the Andrew Apostle came about 12 years ago or so, and he's one of the Franciscan Friars Renewal, and he mentioned about visiting prisons. So I asked him privately, he said, you know, I've always felt as priest, we should be looking after those in prison and also the poor of the poor, like Mother Teresa. He said to me, Charles, that is not your mission. Your mission is here. I was thinking of doing it on the side, you know, like the, the, the one that we, we have a penitentiary uh, here in Scarborough. So that's not your mission. The one you form, they may be able to do it, but not you. That's not your mission. Again, it's not about what I feel is very, you know, difficult and hard and arduous, but what is God's will. So this priest, he shared with me that he, he went through a really difficult uh, episode he counseled an elder, a dying man um, who was living in an irregular relationship, a woman who was not his wife. And he felt, you know, should he mention it now? And he said, maybe not take a chance because he don't know when he'll die. He's very sick. So he said, you know, you should consider re regularizing your marriage. He said it gently, kindly. But the man was upset, became upset. And his daughter who asked the priest to come and see him, she became even more upset. She was angry. And she started talking about it to other parishioners. She called the bishop up. The bishop called the, the, the priest up and so on. And that turned his world upside down. I said to him, you know, what you did was a really good thing, you know, the fasting and all of that. But one thing you should do, if you're doing like that, he had a spiritual director. You should ask a spiritual director. This is a common wisdom within, um, uh, um, in spiritual direction. Something like that, you should ask a spiritual director. Then um, I said, as good as that is, what the Lord allowed to happen, he allowed it to happen, that difficult event with that man, that is from God. And that will sanctify you much more than, than what that difficult thing that you, you did. That's an example of what I mean. What the Lord allows every event, as difficult it is, uh, is, is, being, is, is allowed by the Lord. Now, with the human, let me go back to the, um, so, so that's in receiving. Let me go back to the human. Uh, yesterday, we talked about the first level. It's so important to sanctify the first level, but we can neglect it. Now, whenever I mention it, it's not meant as a criticism or critique, but this sort of thing happens because it's the sort of thing that, 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 that I did in the past. Um, so if I, say, set up, you know, um, the fourth year guys do the comprehensive exam called integration, theological integration. So if to help the, the, the 40 year, upcoming 40 year class out, I make a reader for them and I, I send them ahead of time at, to link to Quirker so that you can work it in the summer. You know, I, I go through a lot of trouble and set it up a, a, in advance. If there's 12 seminarians in that class, only two or so will reply and say, thank you, Father, or just even acknowledge it. There's a, it's not that I, I need people to thank me. I, I don't really care. But it's, it's, it's your growth. If you're a gentleman, you, you'll show gratitude. You'll at least acknowledge, Father, thank you, I received it, or something like that. Um, it, it's, it's like a Lord um, saying to the, uh, um, to the one leper who came back to thank him, he said, were there not nine others? One, one, two of the signs of holiness is joy, the, the cheerfulness, and also gratitude. When I was younger, I didn't know gratitude. As I grew older, I became more aware of what my parents have done for me. Most of us, the younger, we take for granted our parents, take for granted their love. I don't realize that they change our diapers and all of these things. Who, uh, looked after us from the hospital when you're younger, all these things, they, they did all of it. But, but we, we, we don't know gratitude or just acknowledging. If I set up a retreat for, an, uh, say, a number of people, a uh, 30 day retreat or something, maybe one might reply, Father, you know, I, I, I th thank you for that and thanks for setting this up. It's, it's, it's not that it's, it's not a mortal sin, but you don't grow if our Lord says, and this is one of my rules, when I heard, read our Lord in the gospel say, if you're faithful in the little things, you're faithful in the big things. I, I don't try to aim for heroism or martyrdom or anything like that. I, I try to follow what our Lord says. If you're faithful in the little things, if, if I do the little things really well, then if martyrdom comes, then I'll be ready for it. If I can't do the little things well, then... Um, you know, um, regarding uh, popularity, when you ordain, and if you're a good priest, people will love you. 
You'll be like your honeymoon right away. People will love you. Now, I remember one spiritual director saying this. He says, when people give you all this affirmation and love, you can do it in one, take it in one of two ways. You can make it lead to pride and you, and you keep looking for that. That's what Father, Father John Sullivan mentioned. Remember I, I said the two, the two uh, priests who talked both about uh, brokenness? And by the way, I remember the word he used. He said, I am a screw-up. That's the word. And, and when we grow holy, we realize more and more we're all screw-ups. And we're all hypocrites and so on. He even used the word F-up. But, but, but it's not to demean ourselves, but it's, it's to realize that we're sinners. There's, there's a temptation, again, at a human level. I see it often. One time we had a, an ordination reception here. A uh, uh, newly ordained priest. And then people came to give talks. And it was, it was like wedding. You know what weddings? People uh, praise the groom and praise the bride. Usually they praise especially the, the bride and, and they make fun of the groom. But the, um, the, 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 and it was like I was praising this, this, this uh, uh, young priest as if he was uh, uh, God's gift to the world. And, and I, I recommend that you try not to do that. You haven't done anything yet in the spiritual life. We get holier when, when we become older. It's a, so w with the um, praise and everything, you, you can either like soak, soak it up and always be looking out for it, or you can direct it back to the Lord. It's the Lord's work. You, you can um, um, say, and uh, try not to look out for thanks and appreciation and so on. You, you'll get it, okay? But to be looking out for it is, is what Father uh, John Sullivan did in Haiti. He said uh, he worked for two years with the poorest, among the poorest of the poor in Haiti. And he said he was making them love him instead of love Jesus. When we get people to love us, we're taking away from the love for Jesus and the glory that really belongs to him. So these are some of the, the human things. The um, emails for me, my rule for myself is out of courtesy, being a, trying to be a gentleman, I respond. I respond the, 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 the same day, if possible. Uh, that, that's one small thing. Uh, I try to be grateful if Father Eric often sends us a faculty, little uh, information or things that are happening. And I, I try to, sometimes at least, say, Father Eric, thank you for, for doing this or something. This, you know, it, it, trying to grow in, in, in those uh, little things. Okay. Um, When we focus, like this priest, focus on the asceticism, there's a danger. Uh, what's his name? Um, Gary Gould Lagrange. I talk about Reginald Gary Gould Lagrange. There's two Lagranges. Uh, there's a Joseph Marie Gould Lagrange, the founder of the um, Ecole Biblique in Jerusalem. This is the, 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 the new Thomas in, in Rome. He talks about those three spirits I mentioned yesterday the good spirit, the evil spirit, and the human spirit. He says, not, we, I, tend, I see that we tend to follow the human spirit, but he says we can follow the evil spirits as well. The evil spirit pushes us to an extreme of asceticism, makes us proud, you know. And then I said, you can tell what is the evil spirit or the good spirit by the fruits. The, the evil spirit leads to disobedience. It leads to pride. It leads to um, self-love and so on. You can tell which is the... Uh, the, uh, which is of the work of the evil spirit or the good spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is humility. It's peace of heart. It's docility and all of that sort of thing. It's self-forgetfulness and love. And they, 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 they're very, two very different spirits. But you only, can only tell by the fruits that, that follow. Um, I mentioned, I'm going to talk about, uh, let me mention it now, about obedience. Um, I mentioned it because I'll, 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 I'll forget uh, later on. Actually, let me hold this because there are two things that apply to this. Um, I will be speaking about suffering. Uh, maybe I should uh, read that. Okay, let me just talk about the power of the, of the higher mansions. There's something that Jean-Pierre Cossard in, in, in Abandoned Divine Prophets mentions. When you follow the higher level where God lives in you rather than we live in God, when you follow the high level, and where it's not my duties, 
where it's not bridged by human virtues and so on, by human activity, where, and, and where it's, it's, it's docility to the Holy Spirit in every present moment, you, you get greater power. But often our Lord may give you sickness and so on. He will take things away. But when he takes things away, he will give you greater graces in the supernatural realm. So if you have somebody, uh, uh, somebody who's really good at hockey, develops a, um, a knee problem, he can't play hockey anymore. Our Lord would bless him with, with, with graces. Uh, Father Thomas Lim, who teaches for us part-time, when he was in the seminary, his father died on his second year, I forget which year, second year. Uh, at third year, his mother was dying of cancer. And he lost about three members of the family, uncles and aunts and so on, within those few years as well. He lost about five members of his family. I knew then that God was going to bless him more than the average seminary because of those losses. So don't be afraid when God takes away things for you. We had a seminary who, uh, a few years ago, he left the seminary, he had Crohn's disease, but he only needs surgery and so on. I, I found out a few weeks ago that he's joining the Augustinians. And uh, um, he, when God takes things away like that, he blesses you. So don't be afraid. There's always a price to be paid. Um, when, but in terms of his power, John Baker said, says, the world will be saved by the abandoned souls. They're often hidden. Think of what our Lord said to um, St. Faustina. Faustina, or however he said, my daughter, whatever words he used, if you become holy, if you become a saint, you will have power over me to help Poland and even all the world. When you're speaking to her, she didn't have that power. When she became a saint, she then acquired that power. It, it would mean much suffering. So remember, you stay at the lower levels, you have the human ability. Like that important priest I mentioned, you preach to 800 people or whatever, 600 people, but you don't have much influence. All those people I mentioned who ha have the um, uh, humiliations and so on, they have great power. St. Andrew Bissett, two to three hundred people were waiting outside his door to see him every day. They, they weren't waiting to see anybody else, just him. The same with Solana, Father Solana Skati, the one who was not allowed to preach or hear confessions because of his poor academics. 250 or so people waiting every day to see him. Not any of the other priests who are academically good or professors, they were waiting to see him. John Vianney, all of France was coming to him. Padre Pio, all of Italy was coming to him. I, I believe Sister Bridge McKenna might be holy. It's up to the Church to canonize and so on. Uh, I, I have a few indications that she might be holy, uh, saintly. When she was here, for the uh, uh, retreat a year or two ago, almost practically every seminarian signed up this year. I, I couldn't think of one. There might have been one or so. Every single priest here signed up this year except uh, one. I wanted to sign up, but there, there just wasn't enough room. About seven or eight staff members signed up to see her. And then other people wanted, they found that they were here. They wanted a piece of her. There was a rally, a charismatic rally. They, they, they bought her. There's a women's group. They wanted to see her, so after she finished Saturday, her retreat here, an hour or two later, they, they, we, we had a meeting here for them. Uh, I mentioned to somebody outside, Sister Bridge McKenna, says, I know somebody who's very sick with cancer, can't, can't see. And, and she would try to see everyone. That's the power of the upper mansions. If you want to stay with the upper mansions, fine, but you know, you, you will not have much influence. You'll have the kind of a human influence with grace. It's as if our, our Lord is saying to you and me, what, what he's saying in that kind of uh, instruction parable about a wedding. He said, if there's a wedding feast or whatever, choose the, the lowest place. And then the, um, whatever, the groom or someone might say, come up higher, friend, come up higher. Our Lord is saying the same to you. Come up higher. Don't stay, to be stuck at that first level. Be good at the first level and wait for the Holy Spirit to, to be, be, be focused on the, um, on, the, uh, the, on, on the docility. When people are focused on one of the, the human gifts, they tend to be very intense and very enthusiastic. One um, priest was uh, going to Madonna House. He was all big about, uh, he was going to get his doctorate in psychology. And so he was at, at lunch or something, he was sharing, uh, uh, just waxing eloquently with psychology, and a woman 
at a table, Fanny said, she slammed her hand on, 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 on the table and he says, give us God. He's kind of shocked and maybe a little bit offended, but he continued. <laughs> she said again, slammed her, her hand on, 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 the, uh, on the table and says, give us God. The woman who, who did that was the Baroness, the foundress of, of Madonna House, Catherine Dorothy. And she understood that we, we don't, uh, psychology helps. But the people of God need God, not psychology. And people of God doesn't need a winning personality, a popularity, or a beautiful voice. Uh, it helps if, if you have them, thanks be to God, uh, all the more power to you. But that, that doesn't convert our, our intellectual, theological knowledge. I have come to realize that in the last few years. And so I used to put a lot of emphasis working in a seminary, I realized how important a seminary is on my teaching, preaching, spiritual direction. Now I don't, I do not care, but I, that's the 10%. Now I focus the degree I'm with the Lord in the upper mansions, to that degree I'm helping not only people here, but all over the world. You, you know the famous saying I came up with? Go big or go home. I'm joking. Okay. Now. Let's, let's go to, um, I, I went a little uh, longer than I, I wanted. Okay. Father Edwin mentioned this, um, and he asked me to talk about this. The, 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 um, the, the two parts, and they're related, is universal love, and then uh, that usually goes with the cross. Okay? I'm going to use someone who I recommend to you to, to read, and his name is Dom, an abbot, famous abbot, Columba Marmion, he was an I from Ireland, he went to Belgium, and then I guess he learned French and everything, became an, a, a, a great abbot there. And I don't know if he's already canonized, uh, you probably know, he's, he was at least blessed, maybe even canonized by now. He had a lot of experience, he was a f uh, very popular spiritual director. As a monk, I, I think a lot of his spiritual director was by correspondence, so, because he directed also religious Carmelites and so on. And he discovered what was the main problem of most religious, which probably applies to us too. And this is my experience too with lay people and so on. I, I just give you the key part and then read the whole entire phrase. I am convinced that the great cause of their troubles, the religious, is that most of them think too much about themselves and too little of Jesus and souls. I think this is most, most of us, we have that problem. So let me read the whole thing to you because the first part's important as well. I am... This is his book, um, Union with God, a Spiritual Direction to something like that, and pages 130 to 131. As I highly recommend that book as well. When we are closely united to Jesus during the divine office and holy mass, in his relations with the Father, with the blessed in heaven, and with the faithful souls upon earth, we realize those sublime words of the sacred heart, so that all may be one, as you, Father, in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us. Now comes that important part, the uh, other important part. We become so, so the idea is to be one with the Father and Jesus, the way Jesus is one with the Father. So how, how do you and I do that? We, so to speak, become one with him when we take upon us, with him, all the sorrows, the sighings, the sufferings of Holy Church and intercede in the name of all, full of confidence in his merits, in his infinite merits. When we take upon us, with him, with Jesus, all the sorrows, sighings, the sufferings of Holy Church, and intercede in the name of all, full of confidence in his infinite merits. It's a little bit like being co-redeeming the world with Jesus. That's essentially what it is. You call it intercession, but also with reparation and so on. Okay. When we act thus, like this habitually, we go out of ourselves. Father Eden mentioned that. We forget our own little sorrows and, and annoyances, and we think much more about God and souls. Again, it's not like we forget ourselves entirely, but I'm talking about 10%, 90%. My dear child, I'm speaking to you. So this is he writing this into a spiritual directly. My dear child, I'm speaking to you in this way. Because the more I see of religious, both men and women, the more I'm convinced that the great cause of their troubles is that most of them think too much of themselves and too little of Jesus and souls. If they could once and for all go out of themselves and consecrate their whole life to Jesus and souls, their hearts would become wide as the ocean, 
they themselves would fly upon the path of perfection. Okay. You as seminarians, I say this usually to the first year seminarians and directees. Going forward, you have two possible ways, uh, paths to take. Most of us, like, like myself when I was a seminary, we take the first path. We come to the seminary and we want to work on holiness, naturally, all of us want holiness. Develop my prayer life, a prayer program, uh, how do I meditate, how do I examine, all these things. Um, the, uh, how to uh, protect my chastity, develop chastity, and so on, very good. How to learn to be responsible, how to uh, live in community and you know, care for my brothers and, you know, and all those things. And many human qualities, responsibility, work at my theology, and so on. All of those things are good. And uh, how to get along with maybe certain forgive family members, all of these uh, the, the things. All great and wonderful. The difficulty with that is that you and I are like Michelangelo making a, the statue, the famous statue of David. We at the same time, we are the piece of marble and we are the um, Michelangelo with the, whatever he uses, the pickaxe or whatever, I don't know, sorry, the chisel. We always focus back on ourselves. Remember yesterday we said that the problem with the enemy is the self? We always focus back on ourselves. If we do that 90% and 10% think of Jesus and souls, we don't get very far. We kind of walk the way of spirituality. There's a better way. That even from the beginning, as you enter the seminary, your 10% is do those things, all those things. The 90%, your main focus is Jesus, the salvation of souls, and then the great needs of the, of, of, of the church in the world. What I'm talking about is typical of most people. I, I just, I've found that in like lay people. Typically, I tell you, often with mothers, maybe in confession. Father, I have three grown-up children. Uh, two, two of them used to be altar servers. They no longer go to mass. I have a grandchild who's not uh, baptized. And maybe one of them is married, but outside the church and so on. All these. Father, I say a rosary for them every single day. Usually I try, to, I try to expand them. So I'll give you one exa a concrete example. One woman goes to Mass daily, confession every week. Uh, very devout, extremely devout, loves the church, the, uh, uh, um, obedient to the church and everything. She even helps out with pro-life. And she said to me, uh, my few children, I pray for them every single day. So knowing that she had a great heart, I said, why don't you elevate that a little bit, big picture. So I mentioned to you, say, uh, uh, several years ago, it was 45 million refugees in the refugee camp. Now it's probably 50 plus, 50 plus million. We, Afghanistan. I was really troubled when I saw what Canada did, the U.S. did. Canada especially. In 2000, I, I, read, I was reading some of these over a few days. 2012, they, um, Afghanistan, the, the people who were, helping the Canadians interpret and so on, came up with a plan to, for the evacuation and so on. They agreed to it in July of this year, last month, a month before the, the final evacuation. And many of them were left behind. Those who were left behind would probably be killed. I found out that they, the soldiers who fought for the other side, the government side, they, they, were, they, they, they were seeking them out and they would execute them. They're executing the journalists and ex including their families. They're trying to find the women who are part of the parliament and so on and execute them. How can we be thinking of ourselves, my little work and everything, when, when, when that's going on? And that, they are there only one group. This is a temporary thing. There's some other probably bigger things. I, I'm always, I, I, I keep being surprised and I shouldn't be surprised that history is that way. The powerful countries are always bullies. In the Second World War, it was the Nazis and Japan and so on. Now it's, um, it's, it's China and Russia, and, and we don't know what the, sometimes, you know, you hear stories of what the, the CIA do and so on. Um, we're talking more about the, um, the to to totalitarian regimes and so on. Yeah. We have, I can't imagine what the prison's like in, 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 in the Third World. It, it must be horrendous. Of course, some of them get raped and all these things. Um, when they come out, can they find jobs with, with that history, with that record? Women who are caught up in a sex trade. Um, uh, the, the children in Africa who have AIDS, or some of them are forced to become uh, child soldiers and so on. We have all, I mean, 
North Korea, um, Cuba, then Belarus now, um, and Myanmar, and so on. We have troubles. And these are Jesus' children. They are our father's children. And therefore, our brothers and sisters. We can't be wrapped up. Uh, we do many good things here. Like last year, we're thinking of, oh, oh, uh, and it's a good thing, we were renovating the, um, the gym downstairs. We're renovating, uh, and I, I think it's going to look good. What Father Kevin tells is going to look really good. That's good. We have um, community and so on. That's really good. But that's a 10%. What about our, our brothers and sisters who are in trouble? John Bosco, I mentioned yesterday, when he was in, in the seminary, he wasn't thinking about my holiness, where am I in a spiritual life, and all of this. Uh, and, and the, he was thinking of the children of the street. Love is the end goal of, of the spiritual life. Love is forgetfulness of myself and thinking of others. The opposite is forget about these people all over the world and, and my, little, my little problems, my, my studies, my family, and so on. Yes, there are problems. There's a better way. I'll share with you. I, maybe I should share with you privately what, what I did when I was ordained. I said to Jesus, look, here are many children all over the world with trouble. I'm not going to pray for my family. <laughs> Don't tell my family I'm doing that. They might not be happy with it. I'm, I'm not even going to think about them. I had elderly parents who were, were not baptized. I, I had several sisters. I had sisters who were married and nieces and nephews and so on. I'm not going to pray for them at all. I'll look after your children. You take care of my family. I'm not even going to look at them. Occasionally, one may ask me, Father, um, one brother-in-law says, my son has cancer. Of course, you know, I, I, I pray for him and so on. But otherwise, I, I don't. And God has blessed my family. The, um, a year before my dad died, mom and dad became Catholic. I wasn't asking for it, but, but God granted me. The, he just blessed me. All the marriages, no divorces. It, probably all of them are very, all of them are practicing the faith. The, the grandchildren and so on. They all practice the faith. The, but, our Lord said to also uh, Margaret Mary Alacoque, "Think of my interests, and I'll think of yours." Now, the temptation for us as priests, as you as future priests, is always to think of self. It comes across in, in different ways. I mentioned the priests who um, was thinking about, uh, he was in the 60s and thinking about his retirement. I said, stop thinking about that. You have work to do. And this, is not, not, this is not time for rest, except for Father Charles. I'm the one exception, by the way. There are always exceptions to the rule. Okay. Um, but then he, um, he, he goes to a retreat every year in the U.S. and, and, and goes for a holiday maybe to Poland or somewhere. He takes a lot of trouble to set up his retreat, you know, like months, uh, and also set up his, uh, his, his vocation. I told him, minimize. You know, like if you have two programs you're working on, you're working on Microsoft Word and Excel, and Microsoft is your main word, word processing, then minimize the Excel, at the make it an icon at the bottom, and, and your, your, your main screen is on Microsoft Word. Our main screen is Jesus and Souls. And our affairs is that little icon at the bottom. Everything, don't, what we tend to do is the, the, what happened to me, any trouble like a seminary becomes like a mountain where, where it's really the size of a molehill or an anthill. But we make it big because it's about us. Meanwhile, the people are, are being raped and killed and so on. Oh, they, they're fine. And they, uh, uh, am, I, am, I, am I my brother's keeper? The, so um, here's something that relates to that and something else. A priest said to me, he shared with me how he felt that he was, he had two words, one was stagnant, and the other one was related to, he wasn't moving, he was stuck in a rut in his spiritual life. He wasn't making progress. In talking to him, I discovered something. When he was in seminary, he was very slow in learning a plan of life, being able to pray. It took him many years as a priest to be fully faithful, meditation, examine, and all that, fully faithful. And many years later, he was faithful. But then he got stuck at that level. And I, I think his problem was when I tried to mention to him the idea of being led by the Holy Spirit in the mystical mansions, fourth mansion and up or the, the, second, of the, uh, the second and third stage, it, it, was just, it, it just went right over his head. He, 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 he couldn't grasp it. For him, holiness was being, and he, he was super faithful. He always wear his collar. He was always obedient. If he had a supervisor or a pastor, he always obedient to the pastor. He's always faithful to the church's teaching. Very super faithful to his duties. 
You wouldn't consider um, I mean, being loose about the responsibilities. Super fit to all the, the plan of life, but he didn't know how to do the, the higher. And that may be why he felt stuck. He really, I believe he wasn't moving because he's stuck in the, in the first mansions. And, and, and that happens to us by the If you find yourself, you're asking yourself, I feel as if I'm not moving, I'm not growing. And this is continuing. It may be because of something. Remember what I told you what happened to me? I'm sick and I, I, I can't I have to say no to everything. I'm feeling guilty. But the moment I, I fo- focus on it, judging my, my, how well I'm doing, and focus on just saying yes to Jesus in every present moment, that, that, would, that didn't become a problem anymore. What someone like him or a seminarian who's wondering, I, I'm stuck, is because you're not listening to Jesus in each present moment. If, if you were with him, you, you wouldn't worry about what, where you're stuck. You're actually doing one thing, but you're, you're judging yourself, worrying about not moving, but you, you're not with him. The only thing our Lord needs is to be with him in every present moment, to, to just move with him, to be abandoned. And so if I just stay in a moment and say, okay, Lord, what are you asking me? What do you inspire me to do? And so on. And I try to accept everything you, you give me present moment. I'm good. It's, it's, um, it's, it's very uh, stable. Now, uh, I realize I, I forgot something. So, being led by Jesus, of course, we talked about I, I, I forgot to mention these two things I mentioned. Uh, let me quickly uh, digress and, and go back to that. So all, all this path um, uh, in high levels require obedience. Let me, I try to mention how important over the years I've discovered more and more obedience is everything for me. Um, I, I didn't read it in a book. I just gradually just got, I saw it in St. Faustina, which helped. Something as simple as vaccination. When the time of, about uh, about take, getting a vaccination came, I have to read a magazine, a Catholic magazine, and there was an article by a, a Catholic doctor, which he, and he was against vaccinations, and his arguments sounded really good. There's a little bit of conspiracy theories about the pharmaceutical companies and so on. So that that, that made me, made, gave me doubts reading an article. I remember when it came up, I. I, I mentioned, I was emailing my sisters, we happened to be talking about it by email. He said, I, I read this article, uh, maybe you should look at this article, and so on. And one of my sisters says, we don't have a choice. We have to do it for our, our children. And that was God speaking to me. I don't have to figure, I'm not an epidemiologist. I am not an expert on, on um, viruses. So I have to rely, but when God speaks to my sister, okay. So if, if what, what else? I'm trying to decide whether I should get vaccination. What, what, what does the church say? The church says, go and get vaccination. What does the Canadian bishop say? Get vaccination. Okay, um, what else? What's another um, a landmark or, you know, a, 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 a source of, you know, um, God speaking to me? The best of science. What does the best science all over the world say? Get vaccinations. I even spoke to a, uh, a priest who was a former surgeon. And he spoke to some experts, and he said, yeah, um, he said they believe the Holy Father made the right decision, and the bishops, they, 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 they're on the right track, and that uh, he himself was going to get vaccinated. And I said, that, fine. The, the thing is, I'm not going to be complicated worrying about it. I want to, uh, it's not about whether I want to get vaccinated. It's whether God wants me to get vaccinated. And God is speaking to me in, in multiple ways. And it's just to be simple. Okay, even when my sister said, fine, we're good, I get vaccination. Again, it's not to do my will. And by the way, you know, I should try not to be caught up with, con- I'm not saying against or for, and, and, uh, ca- caught up with conspiracy theories, whether vaccinations or other things. Uh, um, President Trump seems to be all over the conspiracy theories. Um, but conspiracy theory is not really from the Holy Spirit, I, I, I think. We follow what the Holy Spirit is doing us and be very simple, not be complicated. Complicated is, not, is, is from the evil spirit. The, uh, God himself is simple. He's three persons, but he's one. The holy people are very simple. There's, there's two degrees of simplicity. There's simplicity before complexity. That's not good. But when we have looked at all the factors on the other side of complexity, they come back to simplicity again, which is a docility. That's the, 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 the simplicity. I got that from David Allen. I, um, he quoted someone. Uh, that, that wasn't me. Okay, so... Um, Also, the obedience, um, not choosing for oneself. 
There's one, he wasn't torn to um, seminary. He chose to go to New York because that you get a chance to work with migrants. I don't think that, that may not be of the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to say, I may not have a diocesan priestly calling, may have a religious calling. And I have one of the seminarians who's under me because when he told me, Father, I said, how long have you been thinking about this? Five years, I said, you and I have to discern now. Uh, God may be calling, and he left to join a religious community. That, that's different. But I'm but, um, talking about uh, we are called diocesan, to choose what you want. I know a priest who was sent to studies, and while he was there, he, uh, meeting his bishop in Rome and so on, he told his bishop, you know, I can't work full-time at the chancery. I need to be with the people. I don't think you want to do that. Um, <laughs> Parishioners sometimes say to me, um, Father, do you, do you, would you not like to go back to the parish? I said, I'd love to go out of the parish. I, I love being with the people. But I, I, I say to them, it's not about what fulfills me, what I want. It's about what God wants. I know what God wants um, by what the bishop tells me. The end of story, nothing else. It's, it's about obedience. Like Jesus says, my food is to do my father's will. I tried to tell that to a seminarian. Um, and he was gifted, really gifted, really bright. And he said, professors tell him he was a great writer. He said, I want to become like Raymond D'Souza. And he's always trying to be with important people like the, the, um, the founder of First Things when he comes to Toronto or the uh, circle of, um, that um, Dr. Janine Langan had and all these important intellectual things. And always going to important talks and so on. I try to say, listen, don't choose the highest, like the wedding, the wedding feast, don't choose the highest place. Be like John Vianney. In your heart, desire to choose the lowest place to be sent to a country parish for the rest of your life. And if God wants you to do it, then, then allow him to choose. But don't choose the highest place. He, 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 he never listened to me. But that's all right. Um, the, um, all right. So going back to, um, to uh, this... Um, this, um, so uh, Dom Marmion, Dom Columba Marmion, Columba, by the way, in Latin means uh, dove. Dom Columba Marmion uh, says, I believe that the, the greatest problem, the, the, let me read the actual words. Most of them, that the great cause of the troubles of religious say priest is that most of them think too much of themselves and too little of Jesus and souls. The, the, the saints are the opposite. The saints is the love of Jesus, like Therese dominates, and she wanted to save everyone from the beginning of time to the end of time. All saints are like that. Little, little, little Dominic Savio, uh, salvation of souls. Every, they all, they all, they all like that. And so what he said earlier, we become one with God when we take upon ourselves with him all the sorrows, the sighings, the sufferings of Holy Church and intercede in the name of them all. So what this is, is, and, and Job Leder Kassad says, is to be like a slave, a slave who does not think of his, ma his own interest, but only in mass. It's like um, uh, Philippians uh, 2.6. Uh, is that the one? No. Yes. Um, in Philippians 2, one translation is Jesus took, the Son of God took the form of a slave, to be a slave, to be a servant. If you look at, I mentioned this in a homily or talk, Ben-Hur. He had an old Jewish slave. And after Ben-Hur was arrested and his, his, uh, his mother, ben -Hur's mother and sisters also arrested, they knew he, he was the, like the bursar uh, in charge of his great wealth. And they tortured him. He wouldn't say anything. They gouged his eyes out. And finally they released him. And he, he went back to the house and waited in the hope that one day Ben-Hur or the family would come back. And one day, you know, going to the store, you know, Ben-Hur returned. And he said, Master, they were trying to get, find out where all your wealth is, you know, where he, where he stashed it away. But I would not tell them. He put, I protected your interest. It's all intact. It's there for you. He had a daughter, an adult daughter. And he was thinking primarily of his master, not of his, his own, you know, health and his life. And his he was thinking of his master. 
And the one who loves Jesus doesn't think about his own interests. Like, like our Lord said to Margaret Mary Alacoque, think of my interests. And I think of, it's really what, what our Lord said to Catherine of Siena. Think of me and I'll think of you. The moment you and I think of Jesus, he's thinking of you, he's loving you, he's taking care of everything for you. But what we do is start thinking back about ourselves and no, allow Jesus to, 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 to take care of, of everything. Um, by the way, one of the things to me when we forget ourselves is, is I discovered that the social dimension, community and social again, it always gets me uneasy when I hear seminarians or community talk about community, community, community. Community is important, of course, but that's a 10%. Imagine, uh, I mentioned this before, um, St. Ignatius of Loyola, Loyola he started um, in Paris when he was going to school in the University of Paris. Six first members, Francis, of, uh, Francis uh, Xavier and so on. You, do you think they're all talking about community, community, it's, it's turning inwards? He was teaching them how to conquer the world. At some point, he sent uh, Francis Xavier and says, go, set all of high, he pointed them to the east. He sent it, and he was the most worldly of the six. He sent the most timid one back to <laughs> Protestant uh, Germany to reconquer Germany. That's what he, he taught them, like the Canadian march, to conquer the world. We were focused back in ourselves, community, social, socials. When, when we do that, something's off. That, that, that I, um, I, I read um, the FBI had, had a file on Fulton Sheen. And one, one thing is wrote, he does not have a social life. He's too busy serving God, winning souls with God. He didn't have time for, my, my spiritual director told me this. Uh, one year to made me vice rector as well, and I was really run off my feet. He said, Charles, okay, do the essentials one, but reduce your social. I never thought of you. I said, social is just a good thing, just do it. You know, even going to priest to funerals, I tried to do that, but I don't have time now, and this social, I have to reduce my social. And the second time, later on, he still brought it, reduce the social. And then I realized, if I'm to serve God, I have to use every hour to help, the, help God's people, not about serving me. And, and, and so, okay. Um, now, let, let's go to the final point. So we talk about, there's what universal love, um, Don Marmion, the problem with most people, they, they think of too much about themselves, not enough of Jesus and souls, like Therese. Holy people do the opposite. Holy people, um, remember I said there are three levels of suffering and the highest level that's going across with Jesus? Holy people do what um, Mother Teresa did, or what our Lord gave. So you know the story of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. At a certain point when she was a nun, a uh, Loretto nun in Calcutta, uh, principal of school and you know doing things, I do, as a really good nun too, and Jesus uh, spoke to her on the way on a train on the way to Dar Darjeeling, and asked her to start this new community which began the missionary charity. Go to the streets of Calcutta by herself without any money and everything. When she started to work, something happened to her. It was like a, a dark night, one of the dark nights. I think it was one of the dark nights that John Lacoste speaks of. It could be the second of the two, but it was really difficult. And she felt terrible. She felt her spiritual life was in shambles. She felt God didn't love her. She didn't love God. She, she, said, that she said her, her heart was like a block of ice, cold, no fervor. And she watched all the nuns she was forming, and they were full of charity, full of joy and love of Jesus. She was actually superior, but she didn't know it. And the, the, her spiritual director then wasn't able to help her, but a new spiritual director, his name is Father Joseph Neuner, the author of the Christian faith. He's a co-author of the Christian faith. And he told her, your suffering is a dark night is actually something very special. It has to do with your mission. And so let me try to explain in my way. I forget what he said. When Jesus in his love for us, he, the word we use in theology or spirituality is identification. He identifies, and he becomes one of us. He descends to earth and takes upon himself all of our troubles. That, that's what holy people do. That's, that's what our parents do for us. Mother Teresa was given India as, as her, spirit, her spiritual daughter. So she had to carry India. India was materially poor. She was materially poor. India as a whole, a country as a whole, does not know Jesus. It was spiritually in darkness. And so she 
had to carry in there, who had to carry in there, was in spiritual darkness. And once her second spiritual director, the, the, the following spiritual director, explained to her it was her mission, she was good. She realized it's the work of God, work of the Holy Spirit, it's a dark night, and so on. And she was able to. And she carried this over 50 years until about two weeks before she died. There's a price to be paid whenever um, we carry others. So remember I was trying to say, how, why is the sacrament of the present moment, why is abandonment, surrender at, at, the, at the highest point just so great when it feels so interiorly so useless? I said, well, it's like, it's like the kenosis. That, that's one way of looking at it. There's another way of, of looking at it to see. Abandoned souls go through the crucible. And this is some a teaching of um, St. Jane Francis de Chantal. If you look at her, I forget what is it is, say, Office of Readings. She is telling her nuns in a, in a certain community, in one of her houses, and talking about why is it that if martyrdom is the greatest spirituality, like in the early church, why is it some of the greatest, Augustine, Jerome, they're not martyrs? And the nuns didn't know, she said, because it's a second martyrdom, a martyrdom of love. So they ask her the martyrdom of love, they realize after what she's speaking with herself. She said, this martyrdom is as great, if not greater than the martyrdom by blood, which is a, a, a surprising statement. He said, those who surrender themselves, again, surrender, totally to God, God will sever them from the most precious things to them, family, everything, which he did with her. But, he said, but one, one nun asked her about something, who gets it? He says, some people will not do that. They will not give themselves, they'll hold back, and Jesus will accept that. They're just able to do things for Jesus, but they won't give their heart. But the ones who give them themselves totally are usually the ones that our Lord will take the most from. But, but, but they're kind of hidden. They, they, they're not what you and I will, 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 will see. Uh, St. Therese, who St. Pius X called the greatest saint in modern times, said, only in heaven will people see how much I have suffered. Most people don't know how, how much you've suffered. I, I, I can read something to you about her diet. Uh, she was, uh, stomach was giving great problems. She was always cold at night and everything. She was often sick and so on. Many people don't know about this di dimension. The, sorry, um, l let me read you this, and I, I'm thinking this might be from Lu Father Archbishop Luis Martinez. I believe he's a saint. He was a spiritual director of Conchita, the, Mexico City, um, and she is in a, a cause of canonization has been introduced. And he speaks about pain being the greatest thing on earth. It's a really uh, um, impressive uh, thing. So let me read you this. And this is from his book. Um, I forget which book it is. Um, I quote, Pain is the final word of love on earth, as unfailing joy is of love in heaven. The Beatitudes, that he ate Beatitudes, blessed and so on, are love's triumphant march. So he says, Beatitudes are the highest, okay? But within that is something special. The delicate shades of its uh, splendid rainbow, the exceedingly full scale of its divine harmony. So of all these um, eight Beatitudes, he's speaking about, he's, he's going to go big picture now. If love steps majestically over the seven mountain peaks, the seven first Beatitudes, Pain, which is the eighth beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted, pain must tint them with its mysterious, mysterious color. So all of those beatitudes must have the tint of the cross. Pain is the richness of poverty, the refinement of gentleness, the divine touch of tears, the grandeur of justice, the unction or anointing of mercy, the purity of light, the fullness of love, if we could express the Sermon of the Mount briefly, in other words, if we, you and I can synthesize the, the Beatitudes, it could be reduced to the two profoundest words in the human language. Number one, love, which is the most divine of heavenly things. God is love, right? Trinity is love. And the second, pain, the holiest of things on earth. And if you could symbolize those divine realities that hold the secret of happiness, 
So he, he's going to give you two symbols. We could have as emblems or symbols the dove of eternal love and the cross of immortal pain united in the divine heart of Christ, that heart burning and torn, whose wide wound is the only door through which is poured onto the earth the celestial torrent of happiness. I love this. And that's why I'm really happy that they came, I don't know who came up with this, this um, on the altar, the sacred heart, which is what we're talking about. The fire of love, the cross, it is love, the sacred heart is all the love, the cross and, and, and the thorns, the love and the, and the, and the cross. That, that, symbol, that, that just beautifully symbolizes this. And what, what God does with saints, to me all saints are victim souls, but some are particular ones, okay? So God leads uh, souls. So you, you keep hearing things like, um, like uh, one French saint says, uh, and this is in the French, ou souffrir ou mourir. Either I suffer or I die. If I can't suffer, Lord, and some people complain, Rose of Lima, talks about the beauty of suffering, which is kind of, for me, it's kind of foreign, but the beauty of suffering. But all, they all like that. They, 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 if God doesn't send them suffering on a particular day, they feel as if God has let them down, has abandoned them, and so on. Now, um, the... There's something beautiful about St. Therese that um, St. Therese, uh, uh, Catherine of Siena, okay. Catherine of Siena said, Lord, visit on me the wounds of the church. Many of us, when you see troubles, like say some people are not obedient to the church, we complain, we criticize them. Saints don't do that. Saints go into action and they take it um, uh, upon themselves. Let me take a two or three more minutes. Excuse me, this is rather long. But um, um, Mother Teresa has a beautiful thing, and it's in my book, um, fourth book, of, of suffering. There's one with um, Therese of Lisieux that I, I wanted. Um, Mother Teresa, Faustina. Let me just read Faustine. I just want a beautiful one I said to rest. That basically said, God has shown her that for her to win souls for God is true suffering. Uh, that does it. And this is Faustina. I've come to see that if the will of the Heavenly Father was fulfilled in this way, in his well-beloved Son, in other words, Jesus went to the cross, it would fulfill in us exactly the same way by suffering, persecution, abuse, and disgrace. It is true all this that my soul becomes like unto Jesus. Um, What's his name said that? Um, Saint Escriva. His sufferings, he linked suffering with his sonship, divine affiliation. And the greater the sufferings, the more I see that I'm becoming like Jesus. Faustina is saying this. This is the surest way. If some other way were better, Jesus would have shown it to me. Sufferings in no way take away my peace. On the other hand, although I enjoy profound peace, uh, and then he, he goes on. Let me, so let me finish with a victim soul. Among the saints, and, they, and these are in a the minority, a few hundred, many women, God called them to be victim souls. I'll use one called St. Lidwood of Sheda, about 14th century in Netherlands, Holland. She, um, I'm going to read something. At the age of 15, she was already getting sick. She went skating in, in Holland, like Canada, a lot of ice and so on, skating. She didn't want to go, and she broke a rib, and from that moment she, she died at 55, she was on a bed. She went through great sufferings, and she couldn't understand it. Um, the, until um, uh, the parish priest was useless uh, for many years, and her stomach even opened up and wouldn't close. And, and you had to use uh, like a cloth to, to keep her, her, her the organs from falling out and stuff. She went through everything, everything that, there was a plague, she'd get a plague. She, uh, uh, um, souls in purgatory would come to her and ask her to, alleviate his sufferings, and so on. Of victim souls, the person who wrote, uh, one I read of the biography of St. Lidwin of Shedem, L-Y-D-W-I, Lidwine, W-I-N-E, of Shedem. He used a beautiful analogy. Analogy of Holland and the church. Holland is one of the lowlands. Part of Holland is below sea level. 
uh, they built these dikes, which is like walls to protect the sea from coming in. Occasionally, it, it does break and many people die. So it's really, there's a famous thing with Hans Brinker and so on, uh, the silver, uh, I forgot about, uh, uh, the story of this boy who found a, a hole in the dike. He spent all night uh, protecting that thing because he's afraid people would die. And it isn't. Anyways, and um, so that wall is so, Holland is like the church. The sea is like evil, Satan and evil. And every so often, evil threatens to overwhelm the church. And God calls usually one person, only one, all he needs is one, not many. One victim soul, she's like Mother, like Padre Pio, to suffer. And she, by herself, will protect all of Holland and beyond, even beyond Holland. And that's how powerful, because they're one with Jesus on the cross. That's how powerful they, they are. They, they, the victim souls. You see, when we go into the parish, we do like the ministry. All the things you did in the ministry, the preaching, teaching, hearing confessions, baptizing, and so on. That's what you did. But Jesus didn't save us in his ministry. He saved us on the cross. And every priest is an altered priest, not a Christ. So we do the ministry, but the highest thing is what well, Jesus in the cross is the intercession and the, and, the, and, the, and the suffering. That is the highest part of being a priest. Priest is priest and victim. But Fulton, she says, we love the nice part. I, I'm a priest. I'm, forget the victim. But I, I dress like a priest and I'm treated royally. Father Charles is speeding and he gets off. The, this happened to me a few times. And, and they let, let me go because I was a priest. <laughs> uh, they, didn't, they didn't give me a ticket and so on. We get the nice things. We want to be a priest without the, 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 the being attacked because of residential schools and so on. We want just the nice things. So this is what uh, someone wrote of her. Yeah, this is uh, in Catholic Online. St. Lydian is a patron of sickness. She was born in Sheetham, Holland, one of nine children of a working man. After an injury in her youth, she became bedridden and suffered the rest of her life from various illnesses and diseases. She experienced mystical gifts, including supernatural visions of heaven, hell, purgatory, apparitions of Christ, and the stigmata. Thomas Akempis wrote a biography of her. He is the author of Imitation. She was canonized by Pope Leo XIII in 1819. Lydrin suffered a fall while ice skating in 1396, when a fret collided with her and caused her to break a rib on her right side. From this injury, she never recovered. An abscess formed within, inside her body, which later burst and caused Lydrin extreme suffering. Eventually, she was to suffer a seri series, of, excuse me, series of mysterious illnesses, which in retrospect seemed to be from the hands of God. Lydwin heroically accepted her plight as the will of God and offered up her sufferings for the sins of humanity. Some of the illnesses which affected Lydwin were headaches, headaches, vomiting, fever, thirst, bed sores, toothaches, spasms of the muscles, blindness, neuritis, and the stigmata. Um, the, a new priest came along. He, he, in the two visits, first visit, he taught her how to bear the suffering, meditate on the suffering of Christ. She did that with three one-hour meditations, and it helped her greatly. The second time he came, he explained to her that she was a victim soul, what she was suffering wasn't because of her sins. Um, the, but there's a, 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 a very funny episode um, when Jesus, thought, Jesus would appear to her, and, and she asked Jesus for the conversion of a big sinner in, in her, her town. He said, no, um, he's not listening to me. I give him every chance. And she, she pleaded with him a few times. He said, no, my justice requires this. She said, she, she said to, to Jesus, if you won't listen to me, I'll ask your mother. She, she, so Mary appeared. He said, mother, can you get a, uh, I, I want the conversion of this guy with my sufferings. And Mary obtained the conversion <laughs> immediately. The man showed up and, uh, before her and asked for confession and so on, for, of a priest and all of that. Now, let me just um, uh, finish by, in all of this, uh, the difficult things, the persecutions, the terrorism, and uh, difficult things uh, we, we have to face, the pandemics. Don't be afraid. Our Lord taught both, um, um, what's her name, Julian of Norwich and Catherine of Siena, that he's got everything in hand. The, uh, Julian of Norwich is the most famous one. So I just give the one phrase and we finish there. Sin is necessary, but all shall be well, and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. God is allowing sin, allowing no trouble, but don't be troubled. He said, I, I, I've got my hands around all of this, my providence. Don't, don't be afraid. And each of us individually, fear is from the devil. Love, cast it out, love is from God. 
We, you're not human, of course you experience it, but use your faith uh, and, um, to, 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 to obtain that divine thing. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. I already gave you a special blessing this morning at uh, the um, end of the first hour. The Lord be with you. Mighty God bless you, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit.